Hello everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar on Bus Differential Protection. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner of the slide area box. If you have any questions during the webcast, just click that Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as possible after the presentation. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions you have running in the background that could cause issues. Webinars are bandwidth intensive, so closing any unnecessary browser tabs will help conserve your bandwidth. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is recommended. If you find your slides are running behind, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the Help widget at the bottom of the screen. I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Mike Ramlachan, Lead Technical Sales Specialist at GE's Grid Solutions. Mike? The floor is yours. Thank you, Colleen. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, at least those on the Eastern Time Zone, welcome to today's technical webinar on bus protection, one of a series of technical seminars. So please look out for other invites uh, that will be presented in the next couple of weeks on various other interesting topics. Your presenter today, yours truly, is Mike Ramlachan. I'm an application engineer here at GE's Grid Solutions business in the North American region, and I'm coming to you live from sunny Orlando, Florida. Today's topic is focused on bus protection, specifically differential bus protection. I will attempt to present the following topics for the next 35 to 40 minutes or so, and then we'll take question as time permits. We'll start with an introduction on why bus protection is important, and we'll discuss some typical bus arrangements, including what are their advantages and disadvantages. The discussion will then focus on various bus protection techniques or schemes, and how those are affected by CT saturation, and how we deal with CT saturation issues. I'll go through a brief discussion on some advanced algorithms. I should mention that <clears throat> I should mention that the I will not have a lot of detailed discussion on CT saturation because time just does not permit in the uh, allowed time slot for this uh, presentation. Introduction to bus protection. What are the challenges we face when it comes to protecting a bus zone? A bus is a junction point where sources terminate. Typically in our transmission and distribution, those sources are our transmission and distribution lines. At transmission levels, there can be more than a dozen of these type of terminations or sources. Therefore, if a short circuit occurs on the bus, then there will be multiple sources contributing to the fault current, resulting in very high levels of fault current. This results in damage to the equipment from mechanical stresses on the bus bars, can lead to extreme CT saturation if your CTs are not sized properly. And even if they are sized properly, we could still have large amounts of CT saturation due to DC offset. These can lead can be a safety hazard to personnel due to the high levels of arc flash energy produced. We are in today's environment, we are very concerned with the personnel safety and our arc flash energy produced. In the following slides, I will explain how we reduce arc flash energy by using bus protection. We need to identify and isolate these faults to minimize their effects. Conversely, maloperation of the bus protection system has other significant impact, including outages to customers, downtime of our processes, which can lead to significant financial impact, and voltage stability levels that can cause other equipment to be adversely impacted. More serious case being widespread system collapse, such as the 2003 Northeast blackout, which 
fortunately or, or unfortunately, I was part of, um, I was living in New York City at the time. It was not pleasant in the middle of August when it was the hottest time period of the year. Therefore, we must design a dependable and secure bus protection scheme. Not, this is not always easy since to enhance one, we will affect the other adversely. Example, increasing dependability, we might have to sacrifice security. For the most part, we try to emphasize security because we need to keep our customers online. Challenges to bus zone protection. An effective bus zone protection scheme should have flexibility to be applied at many different configurations due to the various bus topologies that are applied. We'll discuss some of the more typical topologies as well as the placements of CTs for bus zone protection. For example, there might be only one bus coupler CT or for live tank breakers, there might be a dead zone because of the placement of the live tank CT. Now, in North America, I know we don't have a lot of life tank breakers, so most of the installations, that I, at least that I'm aware of in North America, are dead tanks, so we don't have this issue so much in North America. Bus recon reconfiguration is also provides challenges and must be considered. So our bus, whatever bus protection scheme that we select or use in our bus design, should be able to handle all of these challenges. High speed tripping, specifically tripping in 12 to 24 milliseconds is advantageous in that it will produce, it will reduce, sorry, arc flash energy and minimize equipment damage. Minimizing equipment damage might be in terms of saving a transformer being, to, being able to repair it in a short time period versus losing the transformer and having to replace the entire transformer and obviously increasing our downtime. One of the other advantages of using bus protection, it has no impact on system coordination issues. If you attended the previous overcurrent seminar by my director, Terry Smith, you would have seen that coordination can add significant tripping time to our schemes. Bus protection, is always in operation and coordination studies are not required to set and select bus protection systems. Bus protection is always in operation, unlike some of the typical, for example, maintenance switch scheme for reduction of arc flash energy while working in a switch gear. For this scheme, someone needs to physically or manually turn on and off that maintenance switch to go into our arc flash mitigation schemes. With the bus protection, it's always in service and we don't have to worry about not having arc flash protection or not. And obviously, minimizing damage leads to shorter repair times and less downtime. Bus arrangements and components. One of the more simpler bus arrangements is what we refer to as single bus or single breaker arrangement, which you will find mostly at distribution and lower voltage levels. It offers not a lot of flexibility, actually no flexibility in terms of being able to operate it. If you need to take a bus outage, you need to take all the breakers associated with the bus out of service, so all your sources, all your loads need to be taken out. If there is a fault on the bus, you need to trip all the breakers on that bus, again, taking out all your sources and all your loads. So not a lot of flexibility in this design. Building on the single bus design, we have a multiple bus section design or single breaker with bus tie design, which we see a lot on the industrial applications and industrial sites. Uh, commonly referred to as main time main schemes. These are again at some of the lower voltages. It offers limited operational flexibility, so 
the zone one loads and zone two loads will be basically be able to pick up 50%, 50% each of our load. And the source might be a dual source on zone one and a source on zone two. So if we lose one of the bus zones, we can easily pick up 50% of our load on bus two. Or if we lose one of our source, we can then pick up the other 50% of our load from the remaining source. So it offers some reliability in the design other than other than some operational flexibility of being able to maintain one bus while being able to keep the loads in service. Building upon the main time main scheme is the double bus with a bus tie breaker, which can uh, is optionally installed. And this scheme is very a common arrangement in the West Coast uh, substations. You find it at transmission and distribution voltage levels. How this scheme works is you can take out any of these breakers for maintenance without affecting any loads in your system. You can take out the bus, one of the buses for maintenance without affecting any of your loads. So for example, if I take out bus one, I can use my isolators on those breakers. So you can see on each breakers, there's two isolators going to each bus zone. So if I remove bus one or take an outage on bus one for maintenance, I can just open the isolators associated with the breakers from bus one and be able to carry my loads from bus two. A fault on either one of those bus only disconnects the circuit associated with that bus zone. And we can then quickly be able to carry, be able to re-energize those loads by closing the isolator associated with the other zone and opening the isolator on the zone that's faulted. Main and transfer bus schemes. In this scheme, there's basically a transfer bus Normally, all our loads are being fed. Loads and sources are connected from bus from the main bus. Then for the transfer bus, if we need to take an outage on the main bus, or if there's a fault on the main bus, we can quickly restore our loads and sources by transferring over to the transfer bus. Also, if we need to take a breaker out for maintenance, we can then transfer that load over to the transfer bus and use the bus tie as the breaker for that load. So B offers really good flexibility for taking outages and maintenance and doing maintenance. The breaker and a half bus. So this is one of the most reliable designs that we have in terms of bus topology. Used at higher voltage levels. It offers probably the maximum operating flexibility of some of the schemes we've seen. However, the drawback is it requires more breakers. More breakers requires more real estate. So this, more, this is a costly bus arrangement in terms of implementation, implementation. In this scheme, we have two buses, bus one and bus two. And our loads and sources are always connected to both of those buses through the breakers, the breaker and a half on each section. The loads and sources on the sections are then are the protection for those are provided by their own systems, protection systems, whereas the bus zone itself is protected by its own bus zone protection. One of the typical bus arrangements that you'll see here in North America is the ring, ring bus at transmission level or high level voltages, 345 kV, 500 kV and above. So there's a separate, <clears throat> in this, all the sources and loads are connected in a ring format with the breaker separating each section. With this scheme, typically there is not usually a dedicated bus protection system. What protects the bus is the line zone. So whatever line protection 
is installed also covers the bus. The only drawback with that is if there is a fault and the protection trips for that line section, we might not know right away if the fault was on the bus section or the fault is on the line section. So we might need to do some additional visual inspection. Whereas if you do have a dedicated bus protection system for these RIN bus applications, along with the line protection, then we would know right away if there's a bus fault or a line fault. But typically, the line protection, because of the economics, you don't have to install additional CTs and additional relays for the bus section. It's more easy to apply this protection by incorporating the bus as part of the line. So now we'll go in through some of the protection techniques that we, our schemes, protection schemes that we use to protect buses. We use the differential principle usually for bus protection, and that principle uses Kirchhoff's law for currents. So basically, for sum of all currents entering a node must equal zero, the node in our case being our bus, or more typically current in equal current out principle. The only variation here is how we implement this principle. There is various implementations. We'll talk about each one. The unrestrained differential, the interlocking, a blocking scheme, the high impedance differential, and finally the low impedance percent differential. Our focus will be on the low impedance protection today. We will cover briefly the other types of protection. The unrestrained differential. Basically, this protection is applied by paralleling all the CTs together physically. All of the CTs come into one junction point and they are parallel together and one terminal point. That terminal point then goes into a relay, typically an overcurrent relay. The advantages of this scheme is it's all you need is an overcurrent relay. So it's very simple to apply this scheme. The disadvantages is we need to match the ratios in all of these CTs. So all of these ratios need to match. If there is a CT that does not have a matching ratio, we might need to install auxiliary CTs to bring that ratio up to match. Here are disadvantages. Uh, External faults can lead to spurious differential currents. So we usually intentionally delay the scheme to write through some of those spurious signals. Hence why we have an ANSI 51, which is a time overcurrent scheme versus a 50, an instantaneous overcurrent. Interlocking or blocking scheme are typically referred more here in North America as zone interlocking. This scheme uses <clears throat> a blocking signal. So all of our sources, so in this example, we have one source. All our loads will then be wired to block our source. So if we have a fault in one of the downstream feeders, for example, I'm showing a fault on the feeder on the right, when that relay senses that fault, it sends a blocking signal to tell the source relay, hey, the fault is not on the bus, you should not trip. If the fault is on the bus, the source relay will not receive that blocking signal and it will trip the bus. Some of the advantage of this scheme, very easy again to implement. We're just using the protection that's already there on the feeder relays and the source relays, so we don't need dedicated CTs. It's simple because all we need is instantaneous overcurrent protection. The drawbacks of this scheme is the wiring. Obviously, we need to wire all of these signals back to our source relay, to our source relay, yep. So there might be multiple wiring that we need to wire back, so terminations and all the wires that we need to run. The other thing is maintainability of the scheme. If we do 
have a break in one of those wires, there's an issue with one of those wires, we might not know about it until it's too late. We also have to wait for that blocking signal to get there, so we need to allow the downstream relay to see the fault and pick its contact, close its contact up to send the blocking signal back to the upstream device or the source relay. So we need to have some sort of intentional delay to be able to wait for that blocking signal. Conversely, if we don't wait in the time period to get that blocking signal, we could be fooled or tricked into thinking that the fault is on the bus if we don't get that blocking signal in time and trip the bus unnecessarily. In modern microprocessor relays, we can use communication to simplify the scheme a bit. So we can use IC6150 goose messaging, which is a high-speed peer-to-peer method of communications between various devices, in this case, our IDs or our relays. All we need to do is have a communication cable run out to each of these relays and maybe a switch to get those signals back to the main relay so we don't have to wire all of those contacts into the, into the main relay. The other advantage of using communications, communication is monitored all the time. So if we lose one of the communication signals or wires or, or uh, connections for our communications, we will alarm right away and know about it right away, and we will then be able to take the necessary steps to fix or adjust the scheme. High impedance differential. This is a scheme that's been used, a tried and true scheme, I would say, that's been used for a very long time. It's very secure, very reliable scheme. The operating signal, Again, like the unrestrained differential scheme that I talked about earlier with the overcurrent, it uses par it parallels all the CT to come into either a sensitive current relay or a voltage relay with a resistor across to read the voltage across the resistor, which is usually called our stabilizing resistor. So for an external fault, there is the currents will circulate in the CT circuit and not through the resistor, so the relay will read close to zero volts or very minimal amount of voltage. And if there's an ex, but if there's an external fault, the differential current will then flow into that resistor and creating a high voltage across that resistor. We will then read that high voltage and say it's an ex internal internal fault. Sorry and it will then trip the protection. The disadvantages of using this scheme is we need dedicated CTs. We need similar ratio CTs, similar accuracy class CTs, everything has to be dedicated to our scheme, so we cannot use these CTs for anything else other than this high impedance protection. The other drawback is if we do have a problem in the scheme, and we need to troubleshoot, it's very difficult to troubleshoot because all the CTs are paralleled into one junction point. So we might need to disconnect some of those points to be able to test these CTs individually. Accuracy um, is also determined by the resistance. So a lot of times to reduce the resistance seen by the CT, we need to run large cables. The low impedance differential. This is the more popular scheme today if you're doing any new bus protection system. If you're installing a new bus protection scheme, this is probably the scheme you will choose because of its flexibility. In this scheme, how it works is, again, on Corcroft's current law, it adds all the currents, what we refer to the differential currents, it adds the currents vectorially to create a differential signal. And then, based, depending on the relay, the relay type, the relay manufacturer, there might be a number of different ways how we calculate the restraint current. Basically, one way is we can add all the magnitudes up to get the restraint currents, or in some relays, they, add the mag they look at the magnitudes of all the currents and they take the maximum current as the restraint. 
Once the differential and restraint current is calculated, we then take a percentage of the risk of the differential to the restraint, and the, based on that percentage, we decide to trip or not. So, for example, for an internal fault, we should have a high differential, and we should have a corresponding high restraint. So our percent differential to slope ratio will be high and we will be able to trip. For an external fault, we should have a low differential signal compared to a high restraint signal. So our differential signal to a restraint signal ratio will be very low so that we will restrain from tripping. Because of this percent differential that we calculate, this scheme is commonly also known as a percent differential scheme. The advantage is no dedicated CTs needed. The re, the, we don't need to have CTs with the same ratio. The CTs can be reusable for other things, such as breaker failure protection. The relay will take care of the mismatch of the CT ratios. Protection of reconfigurable buses is possible, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the differential scheme is formed by summation of the differential currents. Ratio matching may not be required, so you might have different ratio CTs. The relay will do the ratio, ratio mismatch. For external faults, we can lead to spurious differential signals, but very small spurious differential signals. So the ratio should still be small to allow us to restrain from from tripping. In our typical schemes, like we mentioned, to cope with CT saturation issues, we might have to have some sort of time delay to it. With this scheme, we have various way of, ways of dealing with CT saturation, which we'll talk about. So the advantages of using the low impedance differential. No need for dedicated CTs in most microprocessor relays, they can deal with a high ratio mismatch. Specifically in the GE relays, we can do with a 32 to 1 mismatch of the CT ratios. And to deal with CT saturation, we have algorithms to deal with that. And specifically, the algorithms we're going to talk about today is CT saturation detection algorithm using a directional principle and then the dual protection principle are commonly referred to as a dual slope principle. We had previously talked about the bus topologies and we mentioned there are certain bus topologies that give us a lot of flexibility in terms of if one bus is out of service, we can switch the breaker from one bus to the other bus that is in service. But by doing that switching, we change the configuration now of our bus scheme because, for example, breaker A is not part of zone one anymore, it's part of zone two because we've switched the isolator over. With the low impedance scheme, since the C all the CTs are coming individually into the relay, all we need is the isolator position to come into the relay. And based on the status of that isolator position, we can switch that breaker from zone one to zone two. So it all allows us to have a lot of flexibility in terms of reconfiguration of bus bars. This reconfiguration scheme, I don't see a lot in North America. North America is more of a fixed bus protection scheme, but they are out, they are out there. In, prov um, in other parts of the world, the reconfiguration bus bar schemes are more popular because of the, just the sheer number of sources and loads that come into one bus. As I mentioned, the CTs don't have to be dedicated for this type of bus protection. They can be used for other purposes, such as breaker failure protection. And we could have a distributed architecture where we basically install merging units at the breaker location to basically convert the CT wires from analog into a digital signal, which we can then send over fiber optic to our central unit, which is located in our control room. So with this 
type of scheme, low impedance scheme, we can do centralized architecture where we wire all the CTs into one relay at a central location, or the distributed architecture where we can convert the CT signals, CT wires into digital signal and send it fiber optically to a relay. So in modern microprocessor relays, what we try to accomplish in our differential algorithms, specifically for differential algorithms, is obviously we need to have good filtering. So we need to look at just the fundamental the component. We need to have fast response because we need to trip as quickly as possible. We need to have good restraining techniques. Restraining techniques meaning specifically for CT saturation, we need to have techniques in place to deal with that, to, to restrain from tripping if there is an external fault with extreme CT saturation. And we need to be able to be do, dealing with the transient issues during switching operations, be able to provide dynamic bus reconfiguration and be able to do that automatically in our relay. We needed to de dependably able to detect CT saturation in a fast and reliable manner. And we'll talk a little bit of some of the algorithms that we use to do that today. We need to have these schemes to be able to be secure and not trip for external faults, especially external faults with CT saturation. And again, as I mentioned, we'll talk about the scheme that we can apply to deal with that very reliable, reliably. CT saturation. So before we talk about CT saturation, I do want to mention the dual slope curve. So you could see the red dotted curve. This is typically used in bus protection schemes where we have a slope one and a slope two. As I mentioned, it's slope one is the different slope is the differential of the restraint signal. So the lower the differential, the higher the restraint, the more we're going to restrain from tripping. So in our slope one, or the region one of our curve, we expect to be operating normally during normal loading or, or when we have DC saturation, DC offset, sorry, DC offset, which causes CT saturation. And in region two, our high slope is we are gonna be operating it when, when there is a fault, internal or external. So what happens to a fault trajectory when we have an, a fault? So basically we're, we start off at time zero, normally operating, so we have a fault. If our CTs are performing properly, we'll go to time two because we'll have see an increase in restraint signal with very little increase in differential signal. However, if we have an external fault with CT saturation, what's gonna happen is we'll start it again at T0 where we'll be normally operating during loading. Then we'll go briefly to T1 why briefly? Because during the first couple of milliseconds, at least the CT will operate properly. It will reproduce the primary currents properly and reliably until it starts to saturate. When the CT starts to saturate, typically about a quarter cycle, then the trajectory will go from T1 to T2 because when the CT starts to saturate, we will see an increase in differential current. So since we know what our trajectory is going to be, T1, T0, T1, and T2, if we see that sort of trajectory, then we can say, hey, our CT has saturated because we went from an internal to an external fault, uh, external to an internal fault, our CT has saturated, and we can use that principle to determine whether the CT is saturated. Some of the methods of securing bus differential, um, we won't talk about the intentional time delay because we mentioned the the disadvantages of using that. Uh, we talked about the dual slope characteristics. One other principle we'll talk about is the directional principle. So if we talk about the advanced algorithm to handle CT saturation, I mentioned we split the curve into region one with a low slope, slope curve, and then region two with a high slope curve. That pre previously mentioned, in region two, we can reliably detect CT saturation because we know how the characteristics are going to go from T1, T0, T1, and then to T2. So we can reliably 
the detect CT saturation. However, in, if we're operating in region one curve and we have CT saturation due to DC offset, we cannot reliably detect CT saturation in that case because it might be very small and we will not see a trajectory as going from T0, T1 to T2. We'll see a trajectory just going from T0 to T1 into our operate region. So how do we deal with that? those cases? So we set the directional flag, but the directional flag basically says, hey, if I have an external fault, at least one of my currents will be 180 degrees out of out of phase from my other currents. If I other, have an internal fault, all my phases, all my currents will be in phase with, with each other, plus or minus 90 degrees of each other. So if, in this case, if we have an external fault, then we will say, hey, my CT directional, they're not in indicating an internal fault. So if I have a directional operation in zone one, I will not operate because my directional flag has not been set. If I have an operation in region two, if I have high external current, for example, a close in external fault, I have high fault currents, then I will set I might or might not set my CT saturation flag. If I don't have CT saturation, I don't set the CT saturation flag, then I'm allowed to trip. If I do set the CT saturation flag, saying there's a CT, I've detected CT saturation, then additionally, then I wanna look at my directional. So if I do have CT saturation, I'm not gonna look at the, if I do have CT saturation, and I'm going to look at the directional. If I don't have CT saturation, I don't know, need to look at the directional flag. And conversely, same for an internal fault. I'm not going to set my CT saturation flag because usually I'll, I might or might not set the CT saturation flag, but my directional flag will always be set because all my currents are in phase with each other. So whether I trip on region one or region two, I will have a trip output because my directional will give the permission, whether it's region one or region two. So in conclusion, uh, the dual slope, dual breakpoint caustic with, with the transition between the slope is one technique we use for coping with CT saturation. So we have two points of the curve where we slope one, where we operate normally or during DC offset. And in slope two, when we have high external faults with CT saturation, we increase the slope to deal with that CT saturation. Then we have the CT saturation detection algorithm, which basically looks at the trajectory of the fault going from normal to T0 to T1, and then CT saturation taking me into T1 in the operate region of the curve. Once I see that trajectory, I'll determine that there's a CT saturation, and then I look additionally for the directional flag to be set. Typical response times of our differential bus bar protections using low impedance algorithms is about 12 milliseconds plus the contact operate time. And maximum, and I'm talking, these operate times are for a 60 hertz system. So uh, for a 50 hertz system, it will be a little bit slower, obviously. So we're talking about typically 12 to 16 millisecond operate time, then plus your contact operate time, which for standard contact is about five milliseconds. So we're looking at about 17 to 21 milliseconds. If we use high speed output contacts, which are generally less than point two milliseconds, then it adds um, not any significant delay to our tripping time. And because of using the dual slope characteristics, characteristic and our CT saturation detection algorithm, we can provide a really good stability for external fault. So making our system very reliable and secure. With that, we will start the Q&A part of the presentation. Olí.
So just a reminder that if you'd like to submit a question, please click the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. Just type your question in the text field and click Submit. Mike, let me turn it back over to you to begin answering the questions that have already come in. Okay, so I'll read the questions back to you guys since you cannot see the questions. So one of the questions that came in, what's the difference between line differential and bus bar differential protection? A couple of differences. One, a bus bar to protection, there be everything is in a centralized location at one substation. So the bus relay is at one location, all our CTs are physically at one location. For a line differential system, our CTs are located at different physical locations. So what we need to do is when we sample those CT signals, we need to synchronize those samples together. So we need a communication medium to communicate from one location to the other for a line differential to be able to not only synchronize those samples, but be able to communicate the currents from location A to location B. So with the line differential, there are a couple other things that we need. We need a communication medium, and we need to time synchronize the samples. And bus differential, we do not need those uh, two uh, criteria. How many terminals and zones can support? It depends on the – we have a number of different bus protection relays. So B30 is a – what we call a single box on the P5, uh, P746 and P747, which is a centralized bus protection system. Those can do up to seven feeders, seven to eight feeders, and they could do up to four zones of protection. If you need more zones and more feeder, we can step up to our what we refer to as phase segregated bus differential, which is our B90 and our P541 or five, and, and the 542 and 543, sorry, not 54, 741, 742, 743, where we could do up to 21 to 24 feeders, but we need three boxes. So we need three relays and the need to communicate with each other to to send the signals back and forth. So we need a little more real estate to be able to do more than eight feeders, but we could do several zones in that uh, phase segregated type of protection. Uh, and then this is a related question, is, is the G bus protection centralized or decentralized? We have both. We have a centralized protection, which is our B90, B30, P746, 747. But we also have the 741, 742, 743, which is a decentralized protection scheme using remote acquisition units to acquire the CT signals and send it over fiber optic. We could also do a decentralized protection scheme using merging units, specifically 61, 9-2 LE merging units. Or we can use a decentralized bus protection scheme using our B30, our B90, using what we refer to as a brick hard fiber system. Again, it's a unit, an acquisition unit that sits out to the breaker, acquires the signal, and then that signal goes into the relay. So we can really do both the type, depending on the application that uh, it is called for. Okay, one of the question is, uh, another question is, what is better, high Z or low Z? Well, it depends. High Z is very reliable, very secure for external fault. Uh, more, it's, it's generally been used, so it's a tr um, longer than the low impedance, so it's been, around for a very long time, it's very stable for external faults, but it doesn't give you the flexibility like the low impedance. By setting the slopes appropriately and using the directional and CT saturation detection algorithm for the low impedance, 
we can get the same level of stability and security as we have in the high impedance with the additional flexibility of being able to reconfigure our, our bus protection on the fly. So for example, <clears throat> we don't have to reconnect CTs physically. We can just look at the isolator switches and do that internal on the relay. With a high impedance scheme, you would have to physically reconnect the CTs. So low impedance, with modern microprocessor low impedance systems can be as stable and secure as the high impedance, but much more flexible. The other question is, can we do breaker failure protection for each terminal? If you lose, use the low impedance scheme, yes, you can do breaker failure protection within the same relay for every breaker that you have connected to that bus relay. Um, another question is, can we implement digital substations key merging units as IZ, can we, into this ID? Can we combine additional schemes with a digital relay at the same ID? I'm not sure I um, understand the second part, but I can certainly answer the first part. Yes, we can use merging units, specifically 9-2LE um, and our brick hard fiber system. 9-2LE um, has the advantages of being interoperable with other manufacturers, bus protection relay, if they subscribe to the part of the standard. So in a digital substation, yes, we would install these merging units at the breaker location, digitize the data, send it back over fiber optic to our, to our relays. If you use the brick hard fiber system, you need to use all GE relays. If you use the piece 741 system, you need to use the um, MICOM relays and the hard fiber system, you need to use the UR relays. With the 9-2LE merging unit, specifically our MU320, you can use any relay that subscribes to that standard. And there are a number of manufacturers out there that have implemented 9-2 LEDs in their, in their relays. Also, we can, with 9-2 LE, we can in interface to non-conventional CTs, uh, digital, commonly referred to as digital instrument transformers, such as OP, Rogowski coils or optical CTs. And G has an extensive por portfolio in optical CTs and digital instrument transformers. Okay, another question is, can you dismiss DC transient formula, formula for CT saturation when using defensive protection in regards to CT saturation? Simple answer is you should not. You definitely should take DC offset causing DC, sorry, CT saturation caused by DC offset into consideration because the, depending where your bus bar is, you could be subjected to very high DC offset, especially if it's located next to close by to generators. So you definitely need to take that into consideration. So that's slope one of the curve that I mentioned. That's where you really are setting slope one to take care of saturation caused by DC offset. There is a good um, Excel spreadsheet that uh, the PSRC committee has created that basically in that spreadsheet, you can enter your accuracy class, you can enter your burdens on your CT, you can enter your maximum fault current, you can enter the DC offset that you're expecting, and maybe some remnant flux into the CT, and it'll give you a very good calculation of how you, the CT will perform. And based on that, then you can set your slopes appropriately. Uh, we also have that Excel spreadsheet. It should be available also in our Grid Solution website in our product info page if you can find it on the PSRC website. Okay. What is the maximum number of feeders that can be connected? Depends. In the B90 scheme, we can do up to 24 feeders. In the B30, up to eight. In the P746, 747, we can do up to seven. And in the 747, 
phase segregated relays, we can do up to 21. And same thing with the decentralized schemes, we could do up from 21 to 24. Next question, if CT saturation occurs, what is the action of the bus bar relays, whether it will trip or not? So I think I, I kind of answered this question when I went through the algorithm that we use for detecting CT saturation. So no, if we detect CT saturation, the relay will not trip. It will restrain from tripping. If you use the modern um, relays, the modern microprocessor relays, um, all our differential relays have that algorithm built in. Uh, what is the directional principle in bus bar? Um, I think I meant I did go through that in the presentation. Uh, let's see if I can get that slide back here. So basically, at the bottom left, so that's the, basically the directional principle. We're looking at the angles of all the different restraint signals in and out of the relay. So based on those angles, we can determine whether it's an internal or external fault. <clears throat> Any telecommunication infrastructure or features that are required for proper bus protection operation? Generally, no. The, you, generally, all you need is to wire all your restraints or your breakers into your relay, especially if it's a centralized, uh, for a centralized protection and the relay will make the decision to trip or not, and then you can use the output contact of the relay to trip a lockout that will then trip the appropriate breakers. However, you can use communication to enhance your differential scheme by, by having zone, like for example, we talked about zone interlocking. So instead of using the hardwire contact back to the relay, we can use communication medium to do that. If we need to do a decentralized architecture, as I mentioned, or with merging units, we can use communication communication to be able to communicate those signals back. And if we have, we don't have a break of failure relay that's built into our bus differential relay, we can send a goose signal over communication to a break of failure relay to initiate break of failure there. What bus differential protection in North America is most popular for distribution substations? That's a good good question, and I don't know that I can answer that um, with with any reliability or any uh, assurances, but I can only tell you what my experience is. In the distribution stations, my experience is, is the unrestrained bus differential is the more popular, especially for older distribution stations, because it's very, very economical to apply that scheme. Uh, the transmission station, high impedance or low impedance bus differential is definitely uh, more popular schemes to use because of the speed and reliability and security of that scheme. Okay. Um, are there major issues in high impedance bus bar schemes due to CT saturation? No. Generally, when we set our high impedance scheme, we look at the worst case saturation, and the worst case saturation is we look at a complete 100% saturation of a worst performing CT. And we make our settings based on that. So if we do that calculation properly or we do that study properly, it will be very, very immune to any type of CT saturation. And that's why it's one of the more secure schemes um, out there before, the, before low impedance bus protection. It's especially in the transmission system because it's a very secure and reliable scheme because of that. 
Um, one of the question is how to set the slow points. Uh, that's a very, very, uh, very uh, loaded question. Um, what I can say is slope one should be set for your maximum DC offset that will cause CT saturation. And slope two should be set for a maximum asymmetrical fault current for a close-in external fault that will cause CT saturation. Obviously, how do you determine those two parameters uh, is very difficult to say. You, you need to do also you need to do some fault studies, short circuit studies, and and, and such, and maybe even um, transient studies to determine uh, what type of saturation or, or asymmetrical or DC offset that you'll experience. But generally, but generally, what I would say is the slopes, the default slopes that we have in the relay, those are based on more of the typical type of performances that you will see in CTs that are sized appropriately. So you could start out with those default slopes as a starting point. And generally, not a lot of times we see people change those default slope settings unless they find an issue that they either in during operation or during uh, short circuit studies or, or um, coordination and studies in general. Now, the, the thing that you should set appropriately and not use default settings is the minimum pickups for the differential. So what that is, you need to set it so that it's not going to operate for inaccuracies in your CTs and your break point. So it's going to be the point where you expect to see asymmetrical CT saturation for close-in external faults. Okay. Um, so this question is, I did not catch, understand what's the difference you explained having live tank versus death tank circuit breaker and its consequences and protection. Um, I don't have a slide on this, but generally in a death tank breaker, you have CTs on either bushing of the breaker, on both bushings of the breaker. So that gives you a good zone overlap coverage. So if there's um, a fault on one zone, you should have uh, in the zone to the right or left of the breaker, you will trip appropriately. In a live tank breaker, the CTs are not part of the breaker. They're usually in a separate tank. And it's usually not and because of cost and installation requirements. It's the CT is not installed on both sides of the breaker. It's only installed on one side of the breaker. Because of that, you don't have a zone overlap between the two zones of protection. So between the CT and the breaker, you have what if what we refer to as a dead zone. So if that breaker is open, taking one of the zones out for service, you have between the CT and the break and the open breaker, you have a dead zone, which is not going to be caught by the bus differential relay because it's not part of the zone. So usually what we have is we have like an overcurrent relay that can then be enabled whenever that whenever that breaker is open, or we have a leakage CT that's installed as part of the uh, breaker to be able to determine uh, that dead zone fault. Um, we're about um, to the closing, so Colleen, you want to you want to clo uh, close it off for us? Thanks everybody for your Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mike. That was an amazing presentation. Uh, this concludes our presentation for today. Thank you everyone for your time and attendance. We hope you have a wonderful day.